What a joy to spend these few minutes with you talking about a subject. Boy, I almost hate to bring this one up, but you've got some enemies. I know what you're thinking. You say, yeah, I know who it is. Maybe it's my kinfolks. Maybe it's my neighbor. Maybe it's somebody work. No, 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 no. You've got some enemies, and uh, these enemies became real the minute you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. And a lot of times we Christians lose the battle because we don't recognize that we have enemies. I want to start this off by giving you a memory verse, a verse that has literally transformed my thinking and one that I quote often to myself. I use it a lot in preaching. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4, where the Bible says, Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Say that aloud with me, would you? Greater is he that's in you. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Your body became the temple of, the, of God, the temple of, uh, of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives within you the moment. He indwells you. And greater is the Holy Spirit that lives within you than the devil that's in the world. The devil has nothing to compare to the pr power of God. So God promises you victory. How would you like to go into a war with or to know you've won. That's exactly what it's like living the Christian life. But there's some things we got to know. So I want to divide those enemies into four groups so that we know who those enemies are. And I want to describe those four groups if I can a little bit. Before I do that, I want to take this word world, where the Bible says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. All the way through the Bible, you're going to find the word world. John 17, the high priestly prayer of Jesus. I believe the word world is used some 11 to 15 times in that chapter alone. All the way through the Bible, the Bible tells us, love not the world, neither the things in the world. And we'll talk about that. What does the Bible mean when it talks about the world? Sometimes we have a way of saying when God says that, the world, he's talking about liquor, he's talking about shooting somebody, he's talking about immorality and these kind of things. Oh, they are a part of it. But the world is the culture you live in. So the world today is different than it was 40 years ago because the culture today is different. The world today is different than it was when Jesus walked on this earth. The world today here in the U.S. is different than it is with my friends when I go and visit in India or to Latin America, or to Africa, because the culture is different. But that culture is defined by one person, and that is the devil. And the devil has designed the culture we live in. He is the prince of the power of the air. And he is designing that culture to defeat us if we don't understand who our enemies are, and we do not understand that greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. So with an understanding of that, let me give you the four divisions of our enemies. Number one, and you'll find this right on page number 28 in your lesson, you've got fleshly lust. Fleshly lust. I want to just kind of give these to you first of all. And then you've got your adversary who's the devil himself. And then number three, you've got the demons. The demons, the fallen angels. You remember back in Genesis when the Bible says that God created and then the Bible tells us about hell, that eternal abode of the wicked, that God did not create hell for mankind, but for the devil and his angels. What's he talking about? When Lucifer, the devil, rebelled against God and became a fallen angel, one third of the angels followed him and has become the demons. So you have picked up some adversaries. You've got the devil as an adversary. You've got the demons and the power, these rules of darkness in spiritual wickedness and high places. And then you've got the world, the culture that's around you. So when you look at these four divisions, as I've given to them right here, we begin to understand that in our own power, we're going to be defeated. Without an understanding from the Word of God of where we are, we're going to be defeated. Now, I want to chat with you just a moment, if I can, about something that's very, very important. And that is an understanding of 1 John 2, verses 15 and 16. So let me read them to you, and I want you to listen, and you'll find this right there in your lesson. You'll find as you answer questions that you need to understand what it means to have victory over this. But the Bible says, love not the world, this world that we're in. Love not the world. Well, how I invest my time, and how I invest my money, and how I invest my energy is what I'm in love with. Now, a lot of things in the culture we may have, whether it be sports or whether it be activities or things, they're not sin in and of themselves unless they take the place of God in our life. Then they become an idol. 
And so the Bible says, be careful, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You say, well, I'd like to know what the world is. God said, okay, I'll give it to you. Just like a pie that's cut into three equal slices, I'll give you the, what the world is. Verse 16, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Let me give you a couple words to write down. Write them down somewhere. Come back and write them down in your booklet. That's somewhere. What in the world is lust of the flesh? Write the two words down to do. It's what the flesh wants to do. When the flesh says, boy, I want to be satisfied. There's the lust of the flesh. What about the lust of the eyes? To have. It means you see something, never thought about it, and you want to have it. Even the things that you might want to have that are not sin and of themselves. We have to have the wisdom of God from the Scriptures to whether we should have those things. Well, they should be part of what God's will is for our life. And if we're not careful, we look at home shopping channels, we look at television, we go down and ride down the street and see automobiles, and we see all the trinkets that life has to offer us, the pleasures, the second homes, the vacations, and the activities, and this and that. Next thing you know, our life is full of, watch this word, stuff. <laughs> our closet's full of stuff. Our drawers at home are full of stuff. You know what? We even rent little storage units to put our stuff in and don't visit them year after year. We got so much stuff around us today. Why is that? Our eyes have looked and wanted to have. And because we have the ability more in America than any society has ever had, we reach out and get it. If we can't afford it, we finance it and get ourselves in trouble financially. See, all of these things fit into the victory that God can give you in your life. So God said all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, what you want to do. The lust of the eyes, what do you want to have? And then that pride of life. Maybe the hardest of the three to understand. And that means to be. Pride of life is to be. If I could be this, if I could be the head cheerleader, or if I could be the quarterback of the team, or I could be this person in so-and-so's eyes, then people would esteem me to be better or higher. And you know, God's not against success. And God's not against you becoming and winning the race and becoming number one. The issue is, who gets the glory? Do we turn around and give the glory to God, or do we say, look at me? I'm now, you know, on top. I am the guy that's at the head, and so therefore the honor and glory comes back to us instead of God. So you can see this whole chapter that you've got, chapter number 10, the image of the believer. I want you to read it several times over. I want you to become so familiar with it that you can come back and understand who your enemies are. You never defeat them if you don't understand who they are. Then understand where your victory lies in Jesus Christ. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Memorize it. Understand the world, the culture you're in. <clears throat> Make sure we back off from it when we want to do something. Check it out. We want to have something. Check it out. We want to be something. Wow. Check it out. Why are we doing that? What's the motivation behind that? Now, look at your lesson very carefully. And on page 29, there are but two questions. What are the four enemies of the believer? <laughs> and then you've got another issue that I want to stop this lesson on. And that is, how does one crucify the flesh and yield his members? You do it by. And of course, you see, the Bible talks about you do it by prayer. By prayer, we come to God and we commit ourselves to God. You will find this about four paragraphs down, and you'll find that all of the enemies are without the believer except one. And that's what our inside, this pleasure that we want on the inside. That's the reason 1 John 2, 15 is so very important. So how does one crucify the flesh? We do it by prayer. We ask God. Remember our lessons on baptism a while back. And I said your whole spiritual life, you'll be growing and understanding what the resurrection of Christ. When he died, you died with him. The flesh died. That's not going to become a practical thing until we get a glorified body and go to heaven. But I want to tell you what, you can claim that today. And when he was raised from the dead, you don't have to live in that old life. You can live with that flesh being crucified and have victory in Jesus Christ. I love that song. You sing it in church. I love that song, Victory in Jesus. There's victory. And we as God's people need to understand that God did not leave us here to fight the battle by ourselves. Say it with me. Greater is he that's within me 
than he that's in the world. May God give you victory every day and from this moment forward.